Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome, a dry welcome to you on this very wet uh, evening. I dare say we'll have to blame English rain rather than South Asian time for uh, starting late. It's, uh, we try, especially as a South Asia Centre, to be very punctual. Uh, and we usually are, but we thought we'd give people the benefit of the doubt given um, the weather. But thank you all for coming. Um, there will be people trickling in because we know a lot of people wanted to come to this event, so they will hopefully quietly trickle in. But um, welcome also to the Shaw Library. If I don't know whether many of you have been in this room. It's certainly my favorite room in LSE. Uh, it's a room uh, where our ancestors are worshipped, I suppose. Behind the stand, rather sadly, uh, you can come around and see the uh, oil painting of Sydney and Beatrice Webb and past directors uh, hang on the walls all around. Um, and it's entirely fitting that we should um, welcome back to uh, his alma mater, uh, Siddharth Vardarajan, who was a student here, uh, studied economics. Yeah. Yes. Um, Siddharth, as many of you know, is co-founder and editor of The Wire. Um, and earlier, before that, he worked at the Times of India as editorial writer and as um, chief of Na National Bureau and editor of the Hindu. He has many other affiliations as member of the International Founding Committee of The Real News, a nonprofit news organization based in the US and Canada, a board member of the intergovernmental BP Koirala India Nepal Foundation, member of the Indian Council of World Affairs, and on the editorial board of India Quarterly, a journal of international affairs. Uh, Siddharth also had an earlier incarnation as an academic, teaching at New York University, and then journalism at the University of California, Berkeley, besides uh, currently working at the Center for Public Affairs and Critical Theory at Shivnadar University in Noida, uh, outside Delhi. He's been a recipient of many awards, the Ramnath Goenka Award for the Journalist of the Year in print in 2010. Uh, he was awarded the Bernardo O'Higgins Order, the highest civilian honor for a foreign citizen by the Chilean government for his contribution to journalism and promotion of Latin America's ties with India in 2006. Um, and he also received the Elizabeth Neufer Memorial Prize Silver Medal for print journalism awarded by the UN Correspondents Association in 2005. But the reason, of course, we have invited Siddharth to talk about the challenges to press freedom in a democracy uh, this evening is because of uh, his very recent and current work uh, with the wire.in, which was started by the Foundation of Independent Journalism. And the three members who started it, Siddharth himself, MK Venu, and Siddharth Bhatia. A 2016 article in Columbia Journalism Review identified The Wire as one of the several independent media organizations challenging dominance of traditional <coughs> Indian print and TV media. In December 2017, very recently, The Wire featured in The Guardian's article on uh, how reader funding is helping save independent media across the world. So for, on that occasion, at least for all of us who read, of course, The Wire in this disembodied form on the ether, we suddenly saw a picture of what the wire offices looked like in, uh, in Delhi. And there's a very nice picture of Siddharth surrounded by his uh, team. So since its launch in 2015, the wire has been at the forefront of investigative journalism in India and has published several exclusive groundbreaking stories. In recent months, the wire has exposed and reported on various cases, uh, J. Amit Shah, Nikhil Merchant, to name a few, involving corporates, businessmen, and key politicians. Uh, and all of this makes for very interesting uh, stories, and we want to hear what lies behind them. And I'm sure Siddharth will tell us of the severe challenges that this has posed and how incredibly bravely they have carried on. Uh, the Wire is now available in Hindi and Urdu as well, which is also an interesting uh, uh, expansion of the reach of readership of The Wire. And on a slightly personal note, but also to, to reach out to all of you, I think for those of us who are concerned with uh, freedom of expression, basic human rights of integrity of democracies everywhere, and certainly the Indian democracy, 
a lot of us have supported The Wire in various different ways, by contributing to it, by telling other people to read it. But this evening, I would also urge you all to think about helping The Wire survive and contributing to it. And I say this entirely on my behalf, on behalf of the South Asia Center, who's put this uh, lecture together. I haven't been asked by Siddharth to do this. So maybe he'll tell you himself, but uh, I just wanted to put a personal request out. But now I'll hand over to Siddharth, whom we are all keen to hear. Siddharth will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, maybe a bit longer, and then we will have time for discussion and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mukulika. It's a great pleasure to um, be back at the LSE. I uh, studied here from 1982 to 1986, and uh, have fond memories of the Shaw Library, many hours wild away, uh, bunking, bunking class, um, or, in, or in discussions with people. And uh, there's something special about coming back to give a talk at a place that one studied. So thank you for making it happen. And thank you all for being here. The, uh, the title for, uh, for my talk today is very broad, Challenges to Press Freedom in a Democracy. <coughs> Um, I'm going to focus almost entirely on the situation in India, although I dare say a lot of what I have to say uh, will probably find an echo in uh, other situations, other countries, uh, not just in South Asia but elsewhere in the world, because we are really in a situation that is quite universal in terms of the state of the media, the kind of pressures the media is coming under, and the interplay between uh, what is happening on the media front and what's happening in terms of democracy and the broader domain of the rights of people. And I would like to begin this lecture with, uh, unusually, with an epigraph from Donald Trump. Not that great expert on uh, the media and democracy who is also the President of the United States, but his son, Donald Trump Jr., who is now looking after the family business. On a recent visit to Hyderabad, he said, and I quote, I love the Indian media. They are so mild and nice. <laughs> Unlike his father, who is wrong on a lot of what he says about the media in his country, Trump Jr. read this one right, that too <laughs> after spending barely 24 hours in India. The Indian media is so mild and nice at least when it comes to the government and its friends, of course. I am speaking here about a section of the big media, not the entire, but it is the major section. It is also true that these same sections of the big media have a nastier side too. And that is on ample display night after night. However, their ire is reserved for the opposition for critics of the government, or imagine critics, or those that the government wants to label or target as critics, such as Muslims, Kashmiris, environmental or tribal rights activists, increasingly some of the more vocal Dalit leaders who are coming to the fore, like Jignesh Mivani. Not to speak, of course, of India's mortal enemies, uh, the Pakistanis and the Chinese. My talk today is on the challenges, my talk today on the challenges to press freedom in a democracy like India is to, is an attempt to deconstruct and present for you the backstory to this media schizophrenia of mildness and niceness on the one hand and extreme nastiness on the other. In no major democracy, and I'm weighing my words very carefully, is the media more hostile to the opposition than it is to the government? And so mild and nice, as Donald Trump Jr. put it, to those in power than it is in India. I will try to explain in the course of the next half an hour, 40 minutes, how such a situation has come to pass. But this is also not just a talk about press freedom or media freedom, because when the media becomes so mild and nice, when the media uh, behaves in the way that it's behaving, it creates an enabling environment for 
a country's political institutions to shift in the opposite direction. So as the media becomes mild and nice, invariably, political institutions become nasty. They begin to encroach on the rights of people in different ways. And uh, it is my assessment as a journalist, as an editor, as somebody who uh, lives and breathes in the Indian media ecosystem, that the freedom that the press loses, or as is the case in India today, the freedom that it gives up, has a cascading effect on other freedoms. It should not surprise us, therefore, that as the media shuts its eyes, ears, and mouth, it becomes harder and harder for students, teachers, universities, activists, trade unions, women's organizations, Dalit activists, and others to exercise their freedoms. So there's a very clear link when we speak of the relationship between the state of the media and the state of democracy. And uh, nothing brings this out uh, in sharper relief than what we have witnessed in India over the last three or four years. I'm going to structure my talk uh, broadly in the following way. I will start by giving you an overview of uh, the media and communication space. Those of you who live in India will find this section uh, quite familiar. Then I will discuss the political economy of the media's ecosystem. Thirdly, turn to challenges uh, that uh, media freedom faces in India. And I will try to illustrate this with examples at each point. Um, then I will talk about how these challenges to media freedom impact or get converted into or are part of challenges to democracy in India. And then end with what I hopefully think would be some up upbeat uh, observations about otherwise promises to be very dar and downcast talk on what, might the, what the way forward might be. So let's start, let me start with painting a broad brush picture of the India media, Indian media ecosystem. And, and you know, as in any country, you have different forms of media. And if I were to list them out, six categories, we start with uh, public, uh, the you know, government-owned uh, media. It's only in broadcast, so the government doesn't own any newspapers. You have uh, public broadcast, three public broadcasters, Doordarshan, which is the television station owned by the government of India directly. You have a channel owned by the upper house of parliament called Rajya Sabha TV, and you have a channel owned by the lower house of parliament called Lok Sabha TV. Um, each of these three public broadcasters have a measure of autonomy. In the case of Doordarshan, which is the oldest uh, national television station directly owned by the government, its autonomy is actually guaranteed by law. In, uh, I think, the year 1999 or 2000, the Prasar Bharti Act was passed, and Doordarshan has a budget from parliament. If you look at the original legislation, it was meant to, uh, they were meant to create a committee of members of parliament to whom the public broadcaster would be accountable and could ventilate its grievances without having to depend on the government. None of that has happened. A measure of how tightly the government controls Durudarshan can be seen from the controversy that we exposed in the wire last week where uh, the Minister for Information and Broadcasting, who was the line, line minister handling uh, the public broadcaster, uh, in the course of a fight she's having with the public broadcaster over appointments and various other issues which I will not bore you with, decided to actually withhold the salary money for this television and radio, the public broadcaster. We're talking of 20,000 or 30,000 employees, and the minister unilaterally decided that because they're not cooperating with my diktat, I'm going to withhold budgetary transfers. And, uh, uh, you know, that's her attempt to bring the public broadcaster to heal, a public broadcaster who, in any case, is not very independent. Uh, uh, but that gives you a sense of, of uh, how distant public broadcasting in India is from, say, the BBC concept. I'm sure here um, all of you probably are quite critical or have been at various points uh, of the way BBC covers domestic issues or foreign policy issues. But I can assure you that whatever in the worst possible avatar BBC has been, uh, public broadcasting in India is 10 times worse. So let's set that aside. Uh, 
Radio, there is no, uh, you, we have a lot of private radio uh, stations, but under law, under the law, under the terms of the license, they aren't allowed to have any news or current affairs. It's, this is anomalous in a, in, a, in a democracy. There's no control over print or television. For some reason, the government does not allow private news on radio. So let's set that aside. Private TV news is the third major form of media in India. It's, of course, very vibrant. India, I am willing to wager, has more 24 by 7 uh, news channels in different languages than perhaps the next 20 countries uh, after, after it in terms of the number of channels they have. Uh, we're talking of something like 200 or 150 plus television channels in different languages, different categories. All of them, however, uh, broadly speaking, offer the same kind of mix. So the uh, sense that you will get variety from numbers is not, match, is not borne out by, the, by reality. Newspapers and print, very vibrant, large number of, of newspapers in different languages. Circulation still remains high, unlike in the UK. But there is uh, ample indication that circulation is plateauing if not declining in some, uh, at least for English. But uh, in, in the languages, Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, etc., uh, there is still growth in print circulation. Internet and digital platforms is a new category that has come into its own over the last three or four years. Internet penetration is still fairly low in India, but changing very rapidly. And as um, the cost of handsets falls and as data plans fast, uh, you know, give cheap and uh, fast access to, to, to data, we are going to see uh, a, an explosion in internet use, particularly by the younger generation. And I think the analogy here, uh, the majority of Indians skipped the landline phase and went straight from having no telephone to going straight to having a mobile. Uh, we, will have, we are having a situation where uh, Indians who have never seen a computer uh, will go straight from, and have never bought a newspaper, will go straight from uh, a zero, in it were, to reading news on their phone. Uh, that's essentially the, the, the digital landscape. Um, and you have a large number of websites that have come, have, have come into being. The Wire is one of them, but you have lots of others um, that, that exist out there uh, and which are very visible and impactful. And then, of course, you have social media, which in a way... Uh, turns everybody into a kind of communicator or a journalist. People create content, they share it. They share it in ways that we don't even know. Facebook and Twitter is visible. Uh, you can monitor it. You can take action if something is, is wrong, if something is abusive. But the circulation of information slash what purports or news or what purports to be news on WhatsApp is, I think, an under-analyzed form of media in India uh, and one that uh, is very, very impactful, but in ways that we don't fully understand or fully know, and certainly in ways that we can't quantify. Uh, and I, and I, I'll, I'll return to this uh, subject a little bit later. That's in terms of the broad statistical overview of the media. Seems like a picture of health when newspapers are, newspaper circulation is plummeting around the world. Um, people are getting laid off in large numbers. I was at the Guardian office yesterday for a meeting and they told me about 400 people laid off, non-editorial non and, you know, uh, across the board in, in America too, huge cutbacks, print uh, is, is, you know, print circulation is plummeting, although I think that, you know, talk of the demise of a newspaper is very premature. But in India, you know, it would appear as if newspapers are holding their own. Um, television, if you have so many channels, you would assume that the business model must be working well, and of course, internet uh, booming. However, if you look behind the surface level and peel away the layers and try to understand the political economy or the business model of this uh, media ecosystem, uh, you will find uh, a picture that is far from uh, healthy. Most of these television news channels actually lose money. Uh, perhaps of the 150, uh, channels, maybe five or ten, directly make money. The rest of them survive on the basis of being subsidized by uh, other channels that the, the holding company may run, entertainment channels, or subsidized by other businesses that the promoter may, may operate, uh, which introduces a new and complicated dynamic 
to, uh, uh, to the state of the media in India. So uh, essentially, whether we speak of TV channels or even newspapers, uh, most of these uh, media outlets are heavily dependent on the wider business interests of their promoters for revenue and for survival. And this, uh, this will take its toll on the content of, uh, of, of on editorial content. Uh, secondly, most of these uh, media outlets, in fact all of them, are heavily dependent on advertising and uh, hardly collect any revenue from readers or viewers. In the good old days of newspapers in, in the West, um, at the height of their influence and power, the split in terms of revenue was that approximately 60% would come from newspaper circulation, cover price, and 40% would come from advertising. Uh, in India in the 50s, there was a parliamentary committee that studied the uh, sources of revenue of newspapers and found that the split was 50-50 or 60-40, healthy. Today, uh, advertising accounts for, or co you know, cover price or sales uh, accounts for less than 2% or 3% of the total revenue of, uh, of, of newspapers. Uh, in fact, I would say that um, to the extent to which newspapers lose money, uh, every, every, every additional copy they sell, uh, if I remember my economics right, the marginal revenue is negative because you lose money. Uh, uh, and and you're, you're recouping your money from advertising revenue, but the each, each additional copy you sell costs you around 20 rupees to print and you're selling it for four or five uh, and losing 15 rupees on that sale. And you recoup, you recoup your money through advertising, but of course advertising doesn't depend, advertising revenues don't depend on the marginal sale, they would depend on whether you dominate in a given market or not. And essentially, uh, newspapers that, the top two newspapers in every advertising territory would make a lot of money. The rest of them have to scrounge for uh, any ad that they can get in order to survive. Uh, that's, broadly speaking, the, uh, the underlying political economy of what appears to be a healthy media uh, uh, you know, uh, industry uh, in terms of numbers, but when you peel away and look at the actual business model, you find that these guys uh, are heavily dependent on advertising, heavily dependent on the um, business interests, secondary and tertiary business interests of their promoters. And therein lies the clue or a clue about why the media is so nice and mild, as Donald Trump Jr. <laughs> said. What does all this mean for, uh, for press freedom and the kind of challenges that we face? Well, political economy is a part of the puzzle, but there are lots of other, uh, lots of other factors. Uh, and I want to uh, run through six or seven different kinds of challenges that, uh, that we in the media confront in India. And, and since I describe the political economy of, of the media, let's start with uh, you know, political economy considerations and how they impact on, uh, on press freedom. And the, the most obvious uh, point to begin with is that the political interest of owners uh, may often be aligned with, with that of the government. And we see this very clearly. I mean, this, this could happen independently of whichever government is in power. If you're a clever, if you're a smart businessman, chances are that you don't want to mess you don't want to unnecessarily pick a fight with government. And of course, your appetite for picking a fight with, uh, with politicians or governments would be uh, inversely proportional to uh, the general health of, of institutions in that particular country. So I don't think the New York Times, in deciding whether it wants to confront Donald Trump on a particular story, would be worried about whether the FBI, whether, whether Donald Trump would order the FBI or the IRS to conduct a raid. I don't think uh, uh, the, uh, the owner of the New York Times is losing sleep over the fact that if he runs a story on page one, mm. the IRS will come knocking on his door saying, show me your tax returns for the last five years. Uh, in India, that's not the case. So, so the state of, uh, so the, the uh, when we talk of the political interest of owners or even their risk aversion. Uh, this is very clearly a function of the overall health of 
wider, the wider institutions. How independent are your investigative agencies? How independent are your courts? In case investigative agencies are misused, can you count on the courts giving you instant and quick relief? Uh, uh, and uh, under all these, for all these questions, the answer you would find uh, essentially works against um, media, uh, you know, would essentially restrict the appetite of media owners uh, to um, confront the government on any given topic of the day. Um, flowing from this risk aversion or direct political interest of media owners, is uh, 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 the reality that the balance in the newsroom, and this also has to do with where the money comes from, right? If advertising and, and uh, uh, you know, is, is essentially uh, driving your business model, then what has happened is that the balance in, in the newsroom in India, most newsrooms, favors management slash corporate considerations over editorial. And this is, a, this is, again, a very important factor when it comes to uh, the state of media freedom. You have pressure from advertisers. Uh, this often gets magnified because, as I said, readers pay next to nothing. So uh, one large advertiser, and this is, again, well documented. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Although, I, I, I would, as you would imagine, the more dependent you are on advertising as a source of revenue, the greater is the leverage that uh, a, a single advertiser can, can impose on you. Uh, to give you an example, about seven or eight years ago, the Economic Times, which is the largest business paper owned by and is owned by the Times of India Group, uh, ran a speculative article about, I think it had to do with Ratan Tata stepping down and who his successor might be. And um, the Tata group said, we're not advertising in ET anymore. And the embargo ran for a couple of years until finally the newspaper found a way to make peace with the company. And this was like a relatively minor thing. But I've seen uh, other instances of advertisers leaning very heavily on, uh, on companies. And then, of course, you have examples from the Times of India. Recently, there was a case, you know, this, this whole jewel thief uh, business in India, this, this jewel, jewelry guy who decamped with, uh, you know, a, a huge unpaid loans. And uh, it emerged that a whistleblower who was uh, complaining to the government about this, uh, this scam, uh, apart from writing to the Prime Minister's office and getting no relief and getting no response, also uh, contacted the Economic Times and uh, did not find them very receptive. And of course, uh, it, it then emerged that the Economic Times, uh, you know, one of the ways in which they collect revenue from advertisers is that they, they engage in some kind of barter. So they will give you uh, advertising space and even some kind of friendly coverage in exchange for equity. So it turned out that uh, the uh, Bennett Coleman, which is the holding company in Economic Times, actually had some financial stake in uh, this company that eventually scammed uh, public sector banks of a lot of money. Now, one can speculate as to whether the fact that this newspaper owned shares became a factor in coverage. Uh, my hunch is that perhaps not, because given the way these things work, it's, quite, it's, it's equally likely that the journalist uh, to whom the whistleblower went said, ah, I don't think my editor would be interested and just chase the fellow away. It may not have escalated to a level where somebody says, hang on a minute, we own shares, don't do the story. But uh, the fact that you have a, a, a business model, which is, you know, when, when the reporter knows that, uh, you know, we have stakes in all these different companies, uh, chances are that her appetite or his appetite to do stories that would rock the boat in any significant way would get diminished. And I think this is something that we see. Uh, this is an example of the kind of hidden impact that over-dependence on advertising can have and which impacts very negatively on, on media freedom. Uh, another very unique, uniquely Indian um, uh, business practice in the media has, uh, you know, which has become uh, quite commonplace over the last few years is that many media houses organize events of one kind or the other, uh, and these have become significant generators of revenue. To give you, and, and what these events, so typic, a typical event would be, you know, Hindustan Times Leadership Summit. They'll have these grand titles, uh, or Economic Times, you know, Businessman of the Year Award. And uh, they would raise sponsorship. And a key ingredient of these large gatherings is that you use them to curry favor with the government. So ensuring high level participation from the government, whether it's the prime minister or the finance minister or somebody big, and uh, uh, the more the better. You know, if, you, if you get a whole array of ministers, then the event is judged to be a huge success and you can make pots of money. So this has become an important factor in um, 
even editorial considerations uh, in newspapers. I remember, uh, this is anecdotal evidence, but I'm willing to stick, stick my neck. I've written about this in the past. I, I, don't, I don't mind saying it in a public meeting, but uh, Hindustan Times uh, a few years ago, uh, in fact, the year Modi came to power in 2014, uh, the owners became obsessed with the idea that for their big event that year, Modi should be the chief guest. So instructions actually went out to reporters that until he says yes, we don't want stories that are going to annoy him. So it's as crude and as direct as that. More recently, the same newspaper saw its editor leave. Bobby Ghosh, uh, his name is Bobby Ghosh. Uh, he had been hired, I think, from the Washington Post. It, you know, it's uh, uh, evidence of Indian media being global. So HT headhunts a guy from, from North, North America, Bobby Ghosh, comes and works in Delhi and uh, runs the paper as uh, he was used to, based on his experience of what professional media should run like in America, and uh, began to tread on, on toes that didn't like being tread upon. And uh, at some stage, the government began to signal its, its displeasure at why this editor is doing all of these things. And they sent various messages. Uh, finally, we don't know what happened, but uh, the, uh, the decision to let Bobby Ghosh go, as it were, uh, was preceded by a meeting between the proprietors of the paper and the Prime Minister, where uh, uh, obviously some kind of discussion uh, must have taken place, and then the editor um, essentially leaves. Uh, and again, this is uh, uh, the, uh, you know, when we, when we contacted the Prime Minister's office to find out uh, whether, in fact, the Prime Minister had raised this issue with Hindustan Times. Uh, they confirmed that the two had met, the Prime Minister and the proprietor had met, uh, and also that the context of this meeting was that year, in other words, 2017, uh, that year's Hindustan Times Summit, where, where she was inviting him. And uh, the version we heard was that, of course, the Prime Minister said, how can you invite me, how can you expect me to come to your summit, to your meeting, if your editor is running stuff that you don't like? And then one week later, the editor's gone. So you can, you can do the math, as they say in America, on this. Uh, but the fact is that many of these events, there was an event uh, organized by the Economic Times uh, last year, shortly after the Uttar Pradesh state elections, uh, which was completely boycotted by the Prime Minister and various BJP elements had decided to take part. Uh, but then they, uh, when, when the election results uh, showed the BJP decisively winning. They decided to take revenge against Economic Times, which ha whose reports had, like virtually every other paper, had suggested the BJP might be losing. Uh, and I can go in, in the discussion period, we can go into the complexities of political reporting at election time. It wasn't as if the ET reporters were biased against the government or against BJP. But the BJP took it very personally, and they said, well, you reported that we were going to lose. We won the election, so we're, not, we're, we're staying away from your event. Uh, so they stayed away from the event. They, they issued a list of demands to Economic Times or to the Times of India group, uh, many of which were complied with. One of the demands that was made was that they had a, they had a very popular, the Times of India group runs uh, an FM radio station called Radio Mirchi. And one of the shows um, they do, I, I told you that news and current affairs isn't allowed legally. Uh, so, you know, radio jockeys find other ways of bringing current affairs in. So there was this one popular show called Mitro, which is a word that Modi keeps using in his speeches, or he used to until he found that people were taking the mickey out of him, so he stopped using it. But this one show would mimic the way Modi talked and was called Mitro. And one of the demands, and this gives you a sense of how, uh, how much into micromanagement uh, governments can be when it comes to media. One of the demands on the Times of India group was that you have to get rid of this program. Uh, so the program went. Uh, and so, so, so you know, uh, the point I'm making is that if you, you know, when your business model exposes you to these kinds of vulnerabilities, uh, governments can and will put, use them to put pressure on you. And we are seeing many examples uh, uh, of this. Um, last couple of points on the, on the political economy side. Uh, there's enormous pressure on, on costs, as you can imagine, and this affects news gathering expenses. This, uh, uh, the, the, you know, it, it has become the norm now to have uh, all journalists on contracts uh, so that if any of them act bolshi, the contract won't be renewed. So there is a way of putting pressure on, on journalists to make sure that they toe the line. And television has discovered the dictum that talk is cheap. Talk shows are the, are the cheapest form of television. And since the advertising department tells them that the more gladiatorial you make these talk shows, 
the higher are the ratings, the greater is the amount of advertising revenue. Uh, and uh, surprise, surprise, Uber nationalism works really well. Uh, you have now uh, this model, ghastly model, uh, which originated with uh, Times Now channel, being replicated uh, across the board uh, for two or three hours every evening across all the big channels where you have uh, you know, a shouting match with 10 or, uh, 10 or 12 talking heads. But it's broadly speaking cent right of center. Uh, and um, uh, you know, essentially this kind of coverage eats into ground reporting, investigative reporting. Television owners are much more willing to spend, to, to, I mean, they don't want to spend money sending a reporter out into the field. Uh, much better to organize these TV discussions and, uh, and, and contests and get your ratings that way. And all of this has, uh, has effect. And just to give you a, uh, an example from, of how, you know, I'm going to tie these uh, uh, threads together to give you a sense of what this does to uh, actual news coverage. Uh, you may be familiar with the ongoing controversy in India surrounding the death of a judge called B.H. Loya. Uh, he is a judge who died of a heart attack uh, in December 2014. He was hearing at the time of his heart attack uh, a case of conspiracy and attempted murder. Uh, no, not attempted, of actual murder involving, uh, among others, Mr. Amit Shah, who is now the president of the Bharti Janata Party. And if you look at the trajectory of this case, I have never seen a case with so many unusual twists and turns. Uh, uh, you know, I, I won't bore you with each and every detail, but uh, the fact is that you had the Supreme Court of India directing the Central Bureau of Investigation to investigate the murder of Sohabuddin, who was a petty gangster, and his wife, Kosarbi, in Gujarat in 2004. And uh, the CBI, which, was, uh, which normally comes under the government, conducted this investigation under the supervision of the Supreme Court, indicted a number of Gujarat policemen for what they said was the murder, the judicial murder of uh, Sorabuddin and his wife, and also indicted Amit Shah, who was then the Home Minister of Gujarat, for being party to this conspiracy. Charges were framed, trial begins, or before the trial can begin, in the preliminary stages, uh, Amit Shah fails to appear. And uh, when, a, when one judge gives him an ultimatum to appear, that judge is transferred. A second judge gives him an ultimatum to appear, he has a heart attack. The third judge, within a matter of two weeks, discharges Amit Shah. It's never happened in the history of the CBI that a man accused of murder on the basis of a charge sheet filed by India's premier investigative agency. It's like if the FBI charges somebody for murder on the basis of an investigation that the Supreme Court in the US is personally supervising. And then one fine day they wake up and they say, OK, uh, we were wrong. And charges are dropped before the trial even starts. Very, very unusual. But that's what happens in the case of Mr. Amit Shah. The media point that I'm trying to make is that none of this was deemed unusual or weird or funny or the subject or made the subject of these gladiatorial debates. Uh, I personally, when this happened, spoke to a number of uh, television editors and said, look, this is a great topic. The day that Amit Shah was discharged from this case, I said, this is, you, should have a, you should have a debate on this. And they said, yeah, yeah, this is a great topic, you know, <laughs> definitely, but no, no, no debate happened. And what made this even more suspicious was that the CBI, which is the prosecuting agency, uh, refuses to go on appeal. So even if a judge, uh, on the basis of whatever he imagines, or on the basis of whatever decision he reaches, de decides to discharge an accused person, it is incumbent on the prosecuting agency to go and appeal. Here, the CBI chose not to appeal. And uh, I, I, I mean, we can come back to this in the discussion, but all of this was deemed to be too hot a topic for any television channel or any big newspaper to write about or even write an editorial on. They kept well away from it. Until last year, Caravan Magazine, which is one of those uh, 
part of this ecosystem of independent uh, media outlets, wrote a story about the death of that judge, quoting members of the family, uh, of his families, you know, as to why they were suspicious about the way he died, and pointing to all kinds of inconsistencies in the official version. Uh, this matter is now uh, pending before the Supreme Court, where, the, where independent of the family who have since been bullied and have issued a statement saying, no, no, we're all fine, with, you know, we don't have any suspicions anymore. But now the matter is before the Supreme Court where a, a demand is being made for an inquiry or an independent investigation into the death of this judge. But again, this is a topic that big media is broadly either keeping off or in the case of channels like Times Now or Republic, actively trying to discredit uh, those who feel or who argue that there's something shady in the way that this judge died. That's as far as the functioning of the media is concerned. Uh, the second set of, uh, you know, which, which as I said, I'm, link I'm linking to the business model or the political economy of media. The second set of, uh, of, of challenges that uh, uh, we have to confront if we talk of media freedom in India are broadly speaking legal. And I just want to run you through, some of these would be familiar to you. Uh, the first and most obvious one is the threat of civil defamation and what in North America they call slap suits strategic lawsuits against public participation. We at The Wire have collected, in rupee terms, uh, we were doing the, doing the sums last week, 440 crore <laughs> worth of, I, I don't know what that is in dollars or pounds, but it's a lot of money. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, these are completely frivolous, bogus cases. Uh, and those who are filing them know that these are bogus cases, and, they, and the lawyers who are arguing it know that they're bogus cases. But we will be put through the, the grind of the process, endless court appearances in Ahmedabad and here and there. Uh, one fellow dragged us to Mizoram, uh, a member of parliament uh, and a television owner called Subhash Chandra, who's part of the ruling establishment. Uh, uh, you know, these, these, these cases are essentially a way to, uh, to harass and intimidate. And uh, unfortunately, the, the legal process in India uh, is never ending. And lower courts, uh, by and large, tend to uh, be very lenient with these kinds of litigants. It's only when you go to the Supreme Court or the higher court that you can expect some kind of relief. What compounds the threat of civil defamation is the fact that India is perhaps the only democracy in the world that still has criminal defamation on its statute books. Uh, we were looking at countries that had abolished this. and. Uh, last year, I think Zimbabwe and Kenya got rid of, or two years ago, got rid of civil, uh, criminal defamation. India is pretty much the last uh, democracy that still has this. And it is used by, um, uh, by companies, by politicians, as a means of harassment, because in a criminal case, you then compel the appearance of the accused. So we have to schlep to, to Ahmedabad or to some, uh, some, some, some distant court if somebody files a criminal defamation case. Or in the case of Subhash Chandra, we were expected to go to Mizoram uh, in order for, uh, for, the, for the process to carry on. And this is, again, pure and simple harassment. Uh, sadly, the Supreme Court of India, which considered a litigation, a PIL two years ago, to declare criminal defamation as unconstitutional, used very uh, bizarre logic to uphold criminal defamation making, as I said, India the only democracy to still have this uh, kind of uh, law on its statute books. There is also, in addition to these two forms of defamation, uh, a tendency of courts in India to impose a gag order on coverage of proceedings. We saw this in the Sorabuddin case that I mentioned to you, when the trial court unilaterally decided in Bombay that we will not allow media coverage uh, of this trial on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, uh, a number of journalists, including my co-editor Siddharth Bhatia in Bombay, moved the Bombay High Court to say that this kind of a media gag order is not acceptable. And fortunately for us and for media freedom, the Bombay High Court uh, ruled in our favor and the media gag was lifted. However, the fact that a trial court could even attempt this kind of uh, uh, you know, a gag order is itself uh, very, very uh, worrying and points to uh, the kind of challenges that we are going to have to confront in the years ahead. There is, in addition, in addition to this, the Official Secrets Act. Uh, I had to confront this just day before yesterday. We ran a story in the wire. Um, India has signed an agreement with, this, with Seychelles in the Indian Ocean 
to, uh, to build a military facility of some kind on Assumption Island. And this, this deal is controversial in the Seychelles. And one of the, some critic, anonymous critic of this agreement leaked uh, copies of what was supposed to be a top secret agreement between India and the Seychelles government onto the internet. We ran a story with some screenshots uh, from these documents. And uh, uh, finally, our lawyer said, look, pick your battles. Uh, at least blur the screenshots so that nobody can say that you are, even though everything is on the internet anyway, it's out there on YouTube. But we decided that fine, you know, uh, discretion is the better part of valor. No point adding another case to our uh, growing list of cases. And we said fine, uh, to the extent to which uh, some, some fool may decide Official Secrets Act is invoked here, we, we decided to blur the images so you can't exactly make out what it is. But we reported from that document, so in a way we still are liable for that. But this, is, this, this law exists. and. Uh, I think in Britain they've done away with it, uh, uh, but here in India it's still very much on the statute books and one that remains in the armory of, uh, of government. You also have contempt of court and increasingly contempt of the legislature. So every legislature in India has uh, arrogated or has powers to declare journalists in contempt of, its, of it. So you could, uh, if, you, if they accuse you of misreporting, if they accuse you of writing something that scandalizes the legislature or scandalizes individual legislators, uh, you can uh, find yourself being summoned before uh, this particular legislature to, to answer for your sins. And this becomes an added legal uh, challenge that you have to confront. Uh, India also has a pretty weird uh, IT Act, Information Technology Act. This was notorious uh, a few years ago because of Section 66, which criminalized uh, the digital, uh, if, you, if you made a statement that was considered abusive or that was considered, uh, I forget the word they used in the actual law, but that was uh, essentially sharply critical or something that, I think the word was offensive, uh, uh, then you could be hauled up under Section 66 of the Information Technology Act. This was applied to two young women in Bombay after uh, Shiv Sena leader Bal Thakare uh, who uh, was the leader of this kind of uh, basically fascist party uh, in, in Maharashtra. Uh, and the city shut down uh, the day he died, uh, allegedly out of respect to him. But these women posted on Facebook that it wasn't out of respect, it was out of fear. And for that one Facebook post, they found themselves charged under Section 66 of the Information Technology Act, hauled to the police station, I think they were even detained there for a day until public outcry forced them to be released. When a number of these cases all emerged, uh, finally the government uh, uh, decided uh, that uh, we should issue guidelines for how this Section 66 could be used, even those guidelines were flouted. And finally, the Supreme Court, in its wisdom, two years ago decided, or three years ago, decided to read down this section. Well, since that section has gone, uh, our ever innovative police officers and politicians have latched upon another section, which is section 67, which criminalizes the digital transmission of obscene or lascivious material. Now, it, it will amuse you to, uh, to learn of the kind of material that police uh, forces around India consider lascivious, or uh, material that tends to deprave. So a cartoon that shows uh, Narendra Modi, uh, an unflattering cartoon of Narendra Modi, uh, has been classified by the police as material calculated to De intended to deprave, and people have been arrested, hauled up uh, under Section 67. Uh, this doesn't affect, obviously, big media houses, but it renders, it, it has a chilling effect on uh, online or social media discussions. People are, people are increasingly wary of what they share, what they like. Uh, there have been cases of, um, in fact, we, we interviewed uh, a young boy, he, he was 18 at the time, in Uttar Pradesh, who um, spent 40 days in prison in, in UP for a Facebook post in which he criticized Yogi Adityanath, who was the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh. Adityanath had made a statement that now that I am Chief Minister, criminals will have to leave Uttar Pradesh. So this boy posted that, with all due respect, you will probably have to leave as well because because there are there are all these cases against there are all these cases against you, including some very serious ones. 
And within a few hours of, of that Facebook post, the cops landed up at his home. He was taken to the police station. He spent 40 days in jail, charged under 67. The, 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 you know, how this is obscene or how this is lascivious content, I don't know. Uh, they threatened him with sedition. And finally, he got bail. I don't know if the charges have still been dropped, but at least he's out now after 40 days in jail. So the law, uh, there are various you know, statutes that are, that are abused. Uh, Rajasthan uh, last year tried to pass a law. In fact, they issued an ordinance which said that the media cannot write about allegations of corruption against government officials or politicians unless the government of Rajasthan issues prior sanction. Now, one has heard, I mean, India has a, has a peculiar law that a bureaucrat or somebody in office cannot be prosecuted without the government first giving permission. Even this I find very unusual in a democracy that people in office should have this kind of protection, but there is a certain twisted logic if you, if you go and argue as to why this provision exists. Uh, but the Rajasthan government tried to go one step further and say that, okay, fine, you know, uh, even to prosecute, you need permission, but even now to report, uh, uh, you will need permission. So, so if the police raided the house of an income tax official and recovered money and issued a statement, and this news is in the public domain, reporting it until the government gives you permission would have been considered an offense. I think they envisaged one or two years in jail. Absurd law. Uh, when, when people wrote about this and uh, agitated, the government was forced to back off. So I don't know if this was a kind of trial balloon that uh, the Rajasthan government floated just to see how, what kind of public acceptability it would have. But it essentially tells you that the legal terrain is, you know, remains one where uh, challenges to media freedom are ever present. Uh, I don't want to paint, I mean, the fact is that we have media freedom guaranteed in law and by the Constitution in India. Uh, there is no two ways about this. Uh, print, television, there are no legal restrictions on what you can report or what you can't report within the constraints of whatever I've described to you. But Politicians, officials are constantly on the lookout to see how a given law can be used or misused or twisted in order to put pressure. And the smaller you are, the more independent you are, or if you're a social media critic, uh, chances are that you would be, uh, uh, you could find yourself uh, vulnerable in some way. The next set of uh, threats to media freedom have to do with the lack of transparency in government functioning. Because what the media reports and writes about uh, can be constrained by political economy, can be constrained by law, but is also dependent on your access to information. And here, despite the uh, very good uh, right to information law that was passed uh, about a decade ago, uh, all the um, provisions of the RTI legislation have been, have been, sub, have been stymied, have been undercut by uh, uh, information departments and ministry after ministry essentially withholding information on very, very trivial grounds. Just to give you a couple of illustrations, <clears throat> in November 2016, Narendra Modi pulled the surprise announcement of uh, demonetizing high denomination currency notes. There have been a number of uh, right to information requests to different government departments asking for details of how this decision was, ra was taken, what research went into it, uh, what was the metrics for success that the government had, had, had decided before they launched this, this, uh, this scheme. All of these requests invariably are turned down on absurd grounds. So w one of these requests was turned down that releasing this information would affect the national security of India. <laughs> uh, one of these requests was turned down that releasing this information, I think the question was who all, have, who all were party to the decision? And the response came, revealing this information may lead to, the, lead to a threat to the life of somebody. Uh, so uh, 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 another example, there is a kind of controversy which is not going away, which has to do with the educational qualifications of the prime minister. Now, if you ask me, uh, I'm not very, you know, for me this doesn't really matter because in a, in a country where uh, governments over, successive governments over several decades have underinvested in education, so the fact is that the average Indian citizen has not had access to the kind of education that she is entitled to as a citizen. So you can't, you can't compromise, you can't question somebody's political rights based on whether how well educated they are or not. But the election process requires you to, to fill out a form and an affidavit. And in, in these forms, the prime minister said that he has a bachelor and a master's degree. And people have been asking, can we, can we get more details of this? And 
there is, uh, again, a brick wall that they have hit. Uh, at one point, Mr. Arun Jaitley and Amit Shah appeared uh, at a press conference waving copies of a certificate. Uh, Mr. Narendra Modi's master's, uh, the certificate said he has a master's, and this is actually written in the certificate, an MA in entire political science. Uh, uh, first time any degree certificate had that kind of a description. And when people said, well, we want, they filed RTIs to get the original certificate, and they filed RTI right to information requests in Delhi University to get details of, of his, bachelor, his bachelor's degree. Uh, they have been stymied again on one ground or the other. Now, this is, this is a trivial example, but it just tells you the extent to which uh, the routine dissemination of information has been, has been shut down. There was uh, a request put in recently by the media to find out, uh, by, not, not media actually, it was done by an RTI activist. He wanted to find out uh, the names of businessmen who have accompanied Narendra Modi on his visits abroad. And that has been withheld on national security grounds. Completely absurd. So, uh, uh, but it's, it's in a way, it gives you a sense of, of uh, how the current government, I mean, all governments like to withhold information, but how this current government has taken things uh, to a new extreme. Uh, Part of the same process is the fact that Mr. Narendra Modi, who otherwise loves to speak, has not addressed a single press conference in the four years he's been Prime Minister. Manmohan Singh, who they pilloried as, to use the Hindi phrase, Mohan Mohan. So he's a guy who's Mohan. Uh, Mohan is the Hindi word for guy who maintains a vow of silence. Uh, and that's because Manmohan Singh was a man of few words. He had lots of other faults as well. Uh, this was one of them that they identified. However, during the 10 years he was Prime Minister, uh, he held, I think, three large press conferences in Delhi and several uh, smaller press conferences every time he went abroad with journalists who happened to be on his flight. Uh, and I have uh, been on some of those uh, press conferences and they've been pretty uh, uh, unstructured. Uh, nobody vets a question beforehand. Mr. Modi has not attended a single press conference. He has been interviewed, I think, five times since uh, he became prime minister. And each of these interviews, and I would urge, urge you, if you know Hindi, to watch those, have a heavily scripted feel. It's uh, there are no follow-up questions. Uh, uh, you wonder, you know, why is he asking? Why is he not asking that question? Uh, obvious questions are not asked, and um, uh, they are really quite embarrassing from a, from a journalistic point of view. And this is symptomatic of um, Mr. Modi's preference for uh, one-way, one-way transmission one-way communication. So he's, he's, he he's heavy on his Twitter use, uh, so lots of tweets, which of course he probably has a team doing. Uh, he has a, uh, a monthly radio show called Man Ki Baat. Uh, but he has yet to be in a situation where uh, an unfiltered question has been put to him and he's been forced to answer. Doesn't happen in parliament, hasn't happened with the media. Uh, and even in situations where the media has, has had, you know, access to him is tightly restricted. But whenever the media has even got close, uh, unfortunately a number of, our, of my colleagues have you know, embarrassed us by trying to pose, pose, pose for selfies with him and this sort of nonsense rather than actually asking questions. So, you know, I, I fault Modi, but I also fault the journalists who've, who've had a chance to ask a question but have, have not, not, taken, not, not taken that. So this, this, this this shutting down of, of communication, shutting down of information, uh, uh, the Prime Minister, of course, does it, but min further down the line, minister, other ministers, other bureaucrats are much less willing to talk uh, uh, on or off the record than uh, their counterparts would have been 5, 10, or 15 years ago. That's as far as the uh, operating environment that a, that a, that a journalist uh, has to confront. There are, of course, other forms, other threats to, to press freedom, and I want to turn now to uh, overt government pressure. Because uh, much as I, I, I am very proud of the legal uh, and constitutional guarantees for press freedom in India, we have to recognize that uh, uh, there are a number of ways in which governments can and do exert pressure on media houses and journalists in order to ensure that coverage uh, is restricted or coverage, is, coverage of certain events is uh, of a kind that they want. And the, and the obvious one is, you know, in a media system which is overly dependent on advertising, uh, government is a very big advertiser. So, uh, and typically the smaller you are, the smaller the newspaper, 
the more dependent you are on government advertising. So uh, in, in Jammu and Kashmir and Rajasthan and West Bengal, whenever, you know, and it's not just the BJP, by the way. You have a PDP, or even before that, you had a national conference government in Jammu and Kashmir. In Bengal, you have Trinamool Congress. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, uh, AIA, DMK, when I was editor of the Hindu, and we, um, we ran stories that were critical of Jail Alitha, uh, she switched off advertising for the Hindu. It didn't matter to the Hindu because the Hindu is a large paper, and in fact, there's no shortage of advertising for it. But uh, the fact is that governments, state governments, use advertising as a lever to put pressure. And this has its impact, it has, and it, it produces the desired results often. In some states like Chhattisgarh, the, the uh, award, you know, the, the governments distribute advertising as largesse in order to ensure that they get, they get favorable coverage. Uh, from newspapers, and this is a very clear uh, form of government pressure. There is also misuse of investigative agencies. I mentioned the uh, unimaginable scenario of uh, Internal Revenue Service uh, officials landing up at the, uh, at the residence of Sulzberger uh, of the New York Times. Well, in India, the CBI appeared one morning at the house of Dr. Pranoy Roy, uh, owner of NDTV which is one of the few channels that is still holding its head above the water uh, and is uh, much more independent than any of the others. Uh, it would be a stretch to call it an anti-government channel, which it isn't, but it is independent and is not, is not rah-rah. Uh, and uh, on a very, very flimsy allegation of criminal wrongdoing and financial misappropriation, the CBI turned up one morning at the house of, of Dr. Roy, uh, ostensibly to conduct a search, but actually uh, all of us suspected in the media as a way of putting pressure uh, on, on the TV channel. Uh, you also have examples, uh, to speak from the wires case, of the government deploying uh, ministers and government legal officers, in this case the additional solicitor general, uh, to assist Amit Shah's son, this is the BJP president's son, Jay Shah, against whom we, uh, uh, you know, in, in, his, in his defamation cases against the wire. Uh, I am, we are still, the wire is still injuncted, so I cannot describe, uh, although Mukulika invited me to, uh, I cannot describe what our story on Jaisha was all about, but you can go online and read it. I'll tell uh, them. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I can't talk about it. But uh, he filed a criminal defamation case and a civil defamation case. And it, this is one of those unusual stories where even before the, even before the story appeared, two days before, uh, the additional Solicitor General, who's the second highest government legal officer, uh, sought and received permission from the government to represent Jay Shah in any defamation case that he may file against us. And this is even before the story was published. Uh, so, you want, to, hmm? you want to wrap up? Yeah, so yeah. Just, uh, so, so that's essentially the, so that's one, one kind of government pressure. You also have uh, the Tribune recently ran an expose of uh, chinks in the Aadhaar in the uh, universal ID system, and they were rewarded, their reporter was rewarded with a criminal case being filed. Um, and of course you have inflammatory language used by government ministers against journalists. They coined this offensive term, prostitutes, to describe uh, journalists who are hostile to the government. And you have uh, trolling by the uh, IT cell of BJP or other people who are part of the wider uh, Hindutva Parivar. And uh, I want to mention the case uh, of a Kashmiri photojournalist, Kamran Yusuf, who uh, was arrested and is being prosecuted by the National Investigations Agency, which is the premier counter-terrorist agency in India. And uh, it's hilarious because, uh, and this gives you a glimpse, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up soon after that, it gives you a glimpse of the official mindset uh, and their attitude towards media, because in the, in the official charge sheet that they filed against this photojournalist, so he's accused of uh, taking part in the throwing of stones against the security forces by, you know, the stone pelting is an issue, is a, is a, is a serious problem in, in, in Kashmir at various points in time, and so there were these kids obviously throwing stones at, at the security forces. Kamran Yusuf was a photographer taking pictures of that, but he somehow got arrested. And as part of their official arguments in court, the National Investiga Investigation Agency says, quote, had he been a real journalist, um, he may have performed one of, and I'm going to read it in their, in their original English. Huh? He may have, he may had performed one of the moral duty of a journalist, which is to cover the activities and happening 
good or bad, in his, in his jurisdiction. He had never covered any developmental activity of any government department agency. Any inauguration of hospital, school, building, road, bridge, statement of any political party in power, or any other social development activity by state government or government of India, such as blood donation camp for local public. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the official definition of what the government and what the premier counter-terrorist agency wants journalists to do. Uh, and it gives you an example of the kind of bizarre world that we are in. I really need to wrap up. Uh, I didn't mention uh, the final form of, of pressure on media, which is actually physical threats. Last year, we had two colleagues, Gauri Lankesh in Bangalore and uh, Shubir Bhomik in Agartala, who died, uh, who were killed in the line of duty. Uh, uh, Gauri Lankesh was assassinated by, it now appears, uh, Hindutva fanatics. This is still an ongoing investigation, but preliminary uh, investigations do suggest uh, that she was targeted for the kind of views that she, uh, that she espoused. Just to wrap up, uh, you know, I didn't mention the, uh, the fact that uh, what, what has spoiled, what has made the media system very, very complicated is that apart from keeping off stories, so it's one thing that you don't cover certain stories because you don't want to annoy the government you, and, or your, your owner is very risk averse or your owner supports the government. But we've seen the emergence of what uh, Arun Shori calls North Korean channels, uh, for want of a better term. These are channels that treat Modi the way North Korean TV treats the dear leader or the beloved leader, I don't know what he's called, Kim Jong-un. So you have kind of treatment of Modi that mirrors Kim Jong-un in some ways. Uh, Ravish, the uh, uh, NDTV anchor, has coined the term Godi media or embedded media to describe uh, you know, the channels that are basically uh, uh, in the lap of the government. And uh, what's disturbing about this media is that they are not confined simply to endorsing the government's good work, developmental work. But they have also begun to aggressively uh, echo the communal anti-Muslim agenda of, of the government. Uh, night after night, in many of these channels, you have programs that are calculated to polarize, to divide, to inflame sentiment, to communicate to uh, ordinary Hindus that they are under siege in their own country, that Hinduism or Hindus are under threat, Muslims are, are, are uh, uh, exploiting them in some way. And uh, to my mind, this is a very, very disturbing uh, feature or aspect of, of media, media in a way being complicit uh, uh, in uh, the polarization and incitement of hatred. If Arun Shori spoke of North Korean media, uh, I like to use the phrase Rwandan media uh, in an echo of the role that Rwandan radio in particular played in the run-up to, uh, to the genocide uh, of 93-94. Uh, a lot of what these channels are reporting and many of these anchors, what they say, uh, leaves me uh, really despairing about the kind of uh, atmosphere that they are willfully creating. Uh, and uh, to my mind, uh, this is a very disturbing uh, element which uh, reinforces uh, the need, the urgent need to have independent uh, democratic media. And uh, that's the point on which I want to end. Uh, we at The Wire are one part of that initiative. There are others, there are, I, I don't want to leave you the impression that uh, the Indian media is a barren landscape. I would say even in media houses that I have criticized, you have individual journalists, individual editors who are fighting the good fight, uh, who do the best they can under constraints, obviously. Uh, so it's not as if good stories don't appear or good opinion articles don't appear here or there. But what they lack is follow through, consistency, uh, and uh, that investigative edge to actually speak truth to power. And that's where uh, I feel it's the business model that constrains uh, most of these large media corporations and why at The Wire, when we launched, we were very conscious of the fact that we wanted to be not-for-profit, that if we could keep investors out, if we could keep uh, advertisers out, uh, not that we have any you know, great objection to some, you know, we have advertising on YouTube, for example, but we, we didn't want to be in a situation where we were ever dependent on any one source of financing. And for us, the, the surest guarantee of, uh, 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 of, of being true to what we wanted to do was to place ourselves at the mercy of readers and say, well, uh, here we are. Uh, uh, we are, are performing a service that we think is vital for Indian democracy. And uh, we think you should help to pay 
for for this for this journalism. If you don't, it's in a way, the kind of appeal that we we see the Guardian uh, in the in the UK making. But there are examples: Mexico, Venezuela, Hong Kong. Lots of places where um, initiatives such as what we are doing in India uh, are, um, are are coming up and saying that look, at the end of the day, if the public is unwilling to pay uh, for uh, media, for news, for information. Uh, somebody else will step into the breach with their own agenda. And uh, it's that agenda which is playing out uh, in the big media. It's that agenda which, is, uh, which has impoverished the media. It's that agenda which is impoverishing democracy. We are today at a stage where Indian democracy already stands diminished, impoverished, embattled, threatened. Uh, I would be happy in the Q&A to discuss more examples of other institutions because it is my belief that it is not just the media. Media is one institution that uh, um, is being pressured. Uh, but virtually any institution in India that is capable of offering checks and balances to the exercise of power by the executive today, judiciary, Reserve Bank of India, Election Commission, the university system, uh, the world of art and culture uh, is coming under pressure. And uh, this battle that we are fighting, this battle that uh, uh, journalists of conscience in India are fighting is, uh, is a battle not just to safeguard um, journalism or the media as, as a sector, but actually to ensure that the democratic gains that India has made over the last 65 years, 70 years uh, are, are safeguarded, are protected, and that we uh, equip ourselves for uh, the battle ahead uh, to actually extend those gains rather than uh, go back in time to uh, a society or a country that is polarized, that is divided, uh, and that uh, essentially would then descend into uh, suspicion uh, and, uh, you know, uh, heavens forbid, violence. Thank you very much. So we have about 15, 20 minutes uh, for questions. I have uh, many I want to ask, and I will, uh, did you say you had a question? No? Yeah? Uh, so the microphone's coming around, is that right? Yeah, and then we'll come back to you. I just saw you next, so did Thankar here. Thank you. And can I request everyone to keep your questions really short, and we'll take two or three together, please, so we can get lots in. Yeah, uh, yeah it's on. Uh, this is uh, fascinating and uh, uh, a very interesting talk. Um, uh, I agree with most of the things that you say, but uh, on, um, I'm just wondering whether, um, I mean, where the problem really lies. I mean, it, it seems from many of your examples that the problem is the is law, the libel law. It's, uh, I mean, even if you have a benign politics and uh, business uh, uh, and newspapers owned by, by the public rather than business, um, if the if the libel law is broken, you would still have these problems. Um, so it's uh, in a way it kind of hands over to the political classes or other people, wealthy and powerful, uh, a, a, an easy weapon. Uh, do you agree? Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll take one at the back. This yeah, this hand right at the back. I I just wanted to say that you know uh, at one point you mentioned that uh, for some reason. Uh, radio is not allowed news. Actually, there are 200 or more than 200 community radio stations, so a total of about 1,000 st FM stations are not allowed news because they're terrestrial analog stations. So technology plays a huge role in the way the policies are defined, first point. Second thing is I think you've given us a lot of anecdotal evidence, but what about the structural actual changes over the last two or three decades? For example, in the emergency, there was forced mergers of news agencies cutting of subsidies in ink and uh, you know those kind of things. But today there are structural changes, uh, for example, technological convergence, integrated newsrooms, corresponded with subsidiary holdings and vertical and horizontal integration. So those kind of structural changes, I think, uh, you know, speak to some of the anecdotal things that you've been saying. Could you Thank comment you. more? Thanks. You want to take those two? Yeah. yeah. Um, I agree with you, law is, law is fundamental here. And um, ab in the absence of uh, a renewed challenge to, uh, to these laws, they will be used to harass. Uh, so we are actually uh, seriously looking at, uh, you know, even though the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of criminal defamation as recently as a year and a half ago, 
uh, we uh, are uh, you know, seriously thinking about how uh, this issue can be reopened again. Because the logic and the arguments on, on the basis of which criminal defamation was upheld, deeply problematic. And I think a fresh challenge in the light of so many examples of the abuse of the process uh, could well be uh, carried through. Uh, so I, I agree with you that law, law is, I mean, the law will always, but uh, the reason business models matter is because um, many, in, you know, in the conventional, um, conventionally sort of organized um, media enterprise, the threat of a lawsuit is often enough for uh, somebody to back off uh, because they say, well, it's not worth our while and, you know, uh, there's always a fear that a wider set of interests would be compromised. Uh, so I would say that those other factors also matter, but law is, is, is very crucial. On the issue of uh, technology um, and community radio and uh, the, what you mentioned, the structural changes. Yeah, I mean, I, the, you know, community radio is, um, has a very limited range in terms of reach, and uh, the same laws apply. I mean, the, the restrictions on uh, what you can and cannot do. It's a different matter that innovative, I mean, I've heard uh, radio jockeys take liberties with the law, but they're always, but the fact is that they're taking liberties with the law. So tomorrow, if somebody wants to be vindictive, uh, uh, you, you know, it's quite easy for any government or even a district magistrate or a local police officer to take action. And, if you're, and when we're talking community radio, you're essentially vulnerable at that level. Uh, so, uh, you know, ideally, uh, we would want a situation where uh, you have a level playing field for radio. So if it's legal to do news and current affairs via a newspaper or television, uh, why should it be illegal uh, for the same information or analysis or viewpoint to be disseminated through radio? The traditional kind of home ministry wala argument is that, no, 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 uh, you know, radio spreads very fast and uh, it could be inflammatory, which is rubbish because, you know, you have other technologies which spread even faster. Uh, and then you have the example of Nepal, Bangladesh, where you have uh, a private radio uh, without any of the so-called security uh, uh, you know, problems that uh, bureaucrats, uh, paranoid bureaucrats imagine. And uh, structural change, you're right. I mean, like, uh, I didn't focus on uh, what new technologies have done. Uh, I didn't also look at this whole issue of, uh, you know, the growing corporate uh, control of different channels, you know, the entry of Re Reliance, for example, uh, in TV18. The reason I didn't do that is because having thought long and hard about, you know, it's, it's quite easy to, I, I mean, I think in any, uh, these, are these are definitely factors that uh, would have to be taken into account. But my sense is that what we are witnessing in India uh, is uh, a problem that goes beyond uh, it's not a product of corporate, growing corporatization of media. It's not a product of, of uh, technological changes or, you know, reorganizations in the newsroom because, you know, we, like we run, an, we run an integrated, you know, tech, the new technology has erased the boundaries between a newspaper, a television station, and a website, mm. right? So, so we all uh, compete, we offer competing products. At The Wire, we do a lot of video. We do languages. Uh, newspapers do video. Television channels carry op-eds. Maitrish Ghatak is always, uh, you know, I, I get upset when I see him writing in NDTV.com instead of The Wire. Uh, but that's, 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 the, that's life, right? I mean, so, so, so they, they try to do some things that we do. We try to do things that they do. Uh, uh, but what is, what is the a kind of binding constraint is, uh, I think, the, the, the larger framework, the kind of the ownership, uh, the, the fact that most of these media owners have secondary business. You know, when the Bhaskar Group runs a paper and has a power generating company, or when some Punjab newspaper, apart from running uh, a newspaper, runs a bus transportation company, uh, you know, you open yourself to all kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, and uh, I, I think we, we don't have a clear understanding of how that plays out on a day to day basis. But I think uh, uh, that is what is unique to the Indian story. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I, I've just come back from India a couple of days ago. And, um, you know, last Friday, they, Smithy Arani sacked Nina Lath Gupta, who sort of revolutionized the NFTC. And every day there seemed to be things going on. And 
in the wake of the Tripura result and in ahead of the Karnataka election that's coming up and in the knowledge that we've got a year maximum until the election, it seems pretty clear that this onslaught is all geared towards trying to get that two-thirds majority for the NDA to change the constitution, to try to make India into a Hindu state. If that is where we're headed, what do you think are the countermeasures and the strategies that we need to employ both from within India and through alliances outside of India to obviously try and fight that? It's a big question. Okay. okay, so we'll take a couple more yeah. who are waiting. The gentleman there. And then we'll come back. Uh, so that, that was a very interesting talk and um, more interesting because I still remember the uh, days, our days at the LSC when you used to spend time in the corridors uh, uh, trying to raise the social consciousness of uh, you know friends like me and others. <laughs> uh, and it so it's nice <laughs> to see that you're you're continuing with that theme, but now your audience is the whole of India. Um, but I I, I uh, particularly wanted to um, hear your views about uh, you know you, you alluded to that if as a newspaper you're not in Modi's Godi, then you're pretty much out in the cold. And in that respect, I, I'd be uh, I'm sure the audience would be interested in hearing the story about the wire and yourself in the last three years and how you feel you're making a difference to raising that consciousness. Thank you. Do you want to take those two and then? Yeah, uh, ju I'll just qu quickly run through. Uh, you know, the question that you asked, it's a, it's a huge question, uh, uh, which kind of goes beyond uh, the formal terrain of today. But I would say that, you know, uh, it's, I mean, beyond a point as a journalist, uh, you know, I, I would like to have the freedom to write and report, uh, and I would like to have my colleagues have that freedom. Uh, and I'm quite, I'm quite convinced that if we had that freedom, and if we exercised it without restraint and judiciously, uh, the kind of um, scenario that you foresee would probably not happen, in the sense that uh, I think Indians are very happy being Indians, uh, you know, Hindus are happy being Hindus, but uh, Hindus are not Indians. I mean, all, all Indians are not Hindus. Uh, and uh, it would be absurd to, you know, and I know that there are mad people who want to play around with these categories. Uh, I'm not sure that, um, uh, you know, how this can be fought or opposed, except that as journalists we need to do our job. And I would say that it's not a coincidence that people who harbor these kinds of crazy ideas see the media as the enemy. They see universities as, as the enemy. They see the judiciary as the enemy. They see, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a conscientious bureaucrat in Uttar Pradesh who uh, posted on Facebook uh, his displeasure at what he called a new trend of, of uh, essentially Hindu fanatics going into Muslim neighborhoods in, in, in UP and uh, trying to provoke people uh, by, sh by shouting slogans of one kind or the other. And he said this is very bad. And he was forced to delete his post by the Uttar Pradesh government. Whereas uh, an IPS officer, uh, so that's senior, like, you know, top Scotland Yard guy in Uttar Pradesh, is captured on video taking an oath to build a Ram temple at the disputed site of the Babri Masjid, and no action is taken against him. So that's the, you know, that's the terrain. Uh, these are people who are looking to undermine and destroy every institution in India. Uh, and so the media is, is, the, fr is, the, is, is, at the, is the front line. Uh, and if the media succumbs, then other institutions will go the same way. And uh, Mudassar, your question, I mean, like, it's, it's, it's been a gratifying fight. I remember uh, uh, before we, in fact, it was your father who, uh, before we launched the wire, uh, his father dabbled in palmistry. And he looked at my palm. I was very skeptical. And he said that, um, uh, the, you know, whatever you're planning, he's, it'll be a great success editorially, but there won't be much money. <laughs> and uh, he's, been, he's been proved right. <laughs> but we're not complaining. <laughs> Can I just, uh, before I turn to Anish and this question at the back, just ask a follow-up question to what you said to the first. I mean, the pessimistic reading of what you're saying is basically that there is the critical mass of, or the majority of people in India are inherently, potentially inherently undemocratic. Uh, the press could do its job if it wanted to. You guys are doing it and others are. Uh, but there isn't 
uh, enough collective will to either take journalism seriously or indeed not spread news. You know, the, the, the agenda of Hindutva has the masses behind them. I mean, you know, this would be the pessimistic reading. And I say this because this trite comparison between Trump and Modi that, that is drawn constantly, one can't help notice that every, you know, every time I watch The Late Show and uh, the laughter about Trump that's possible on a daily basis, in public, by everybody, um, is that a sign of a mature democracy which, where you can tolerate criticism, you can tolerate ridicule, you can tolerate laughter and go back to work the next day? He might not like it. I mean, who would like it? But uh, it doesn't affect anything, but you can laugh. It is unthinkable in India, right? It's unthinkable that anyone, I mean, the smallest criticism and you get slapped down for it. So laughter and ridicule, which is the stuff of politics, cartoons, political cartoons, just isn't there. So is this something, you know, are we, can we draw a pessimistic conclusion about the robustness of democratic values in India? Uh, should I say you know? Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not pessimistic about uh, what the people of India stand for, mm -hmm. right? Uh, notwithstanding election results, because, you know, there's a sense in which we overread, we overanalyze uh, electoral verdicts. First past the post uh, essentially converts, and you, you're, you're the expert at all of this, but first past the post converts electro, you know, vote percentages into seats on a very irrational basis. Uh, I mentioned the Uttar Pradesh uh, election results of last year. We know from the vote shares that the stupendous victory that the BJP won, where they picked up something like 85% of the seats, was done on the basis of a 40% vote share. Every reporter, who, and, and the conundrum that we were confronted with was that every reporter who went out there mm. during the campaign was saying it's very evenly matched. And many reporters were saying that we think the BJP is losing. How do you square these two? Well, it's very easy because we know from the vote share that 60% of those who voted in UP voted against Modi. And if you, so 60% of people that you would meet yeah. would say, we don't like the guy, right? So how, as a reporter, how do you convert your anecdotal encounters mm -hmm. into election analysis without going completely wrong because of first past the post, right? So I would say, I, I would reserve my judgment on whether the masses of Uttar Pradesh or the masses of India really stand for Hindutva or this. I, I, I have a feeling that they, that there is a, there is a section, uh, the BJP's historic vote share uh, has been around 20, 22 percent. Uh, in 2014, Modi added another, another 10 to 12% to that, mm. uh, which uh, uh, my friend Pranab Bardhan, who uh, you know, economist in Berkeley, you know, calls an aspirational. These are people who uh, essentially were seduced by the idea. Of, I mean, I, let me not be negative. Who, who bought the idea? Who accept? Who, who liked the idea that he was promising of jobs and development and so on? Right. So uh, that was not a Hindutva vote. No. But where I, where I am pessimistic is in terms of the other institutions, because as you would have gathered from my talk, I don't have confidence in the uh, lower judiciary. I don't have confidence in the independence of our investigative agencies. I don't have confidence even anymore in the Election Commission. If the Election Commission could do what it did last year in delaying the announcement of the Gujarat elections, simply in order to allow Narendra Modi to revise uh, you know, the goods and services tax rate on products that were crucial for Gujarat and various other decisions, then you know, that's one institution that's out of the window. The Reserve Bank of India, which fought so many years for its autonomy, could go along with this harebrained demonetization scheme without any studies, without any analysis. Uh, so that, that's one institution that's out of the window. So that's what worries me, and we don't have a capacity to laugh. We, you know, we, we, did, a, we, we did a piece on this comedian, Sham Rangila. Uh, he does the best mimicry of Modi. He's just outstanding, he's a young kid from Rajasthan. Outstanding mimicry. He was called for a contest on Star Plus, mm. and he did this brilliant, uh, you know, takedown of Modi's style of speaking. It wasn't politically political. He just mimicked the way the guy talked. There was no wider political point, but obviously people were laughing, and the channel. I don't think they they had any direction for Modi, but the channel decided, no, oh, this is too hot to show, and so the, the, that that thing was just scrapped. Uh, even though Modi has gone on the record at various points saying, you know, I don't mind if people laugh. I don't mind if people criticize. But the fact is that you, know, you, you run a certain system and people get a certain yeah. set of messages. And so, so that intolerance is definitely 
uh, increasing in the system. Okay, we have two more questions, final questions. I'm sorry, uh, Anish. Yeah. Siddharth, um, very, very depressing picture you paint, I'm sad to say. Um, and in a way, one has the feeling that the horse has bolted, that all we can do is stand and watch. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't want to say that, but I believe at some level it's true. And of course, then there is fear. And I think that is one of those terrible unspokens <coughs> that is hidden behind what you say. Mm. It keeps emerging. Talk to us about fear. Okay, and a final question at the back. Um, thanks. Um, my question is, what role do you think the media has in determining popular perceptions of history? You know, history is a, uh, I'll answer you first and then come to Anisha's question. You know, history is uh, a huge battleground today, uh, in part because a lot of the political agenda of the Sangha Parivar or the BJP RSS is, is, is rooted through history or is, is kind of, uh, they try to validate through a warped reading of history. And uh, uh, so whether it's, it's Padmavat, Padmavati, or Sangeet Som's remarks against the Taj Mahal, uh, or other kinds of nonsense that you keep, uh, you, you know. Uh, the, the, the other day I was reading about um, a uh, refresher course in Delhi University, that everybody, uh, like if you want to get promoted from uh, assistant professor, no, if you want to go from lecturer to associate professor, uh, anywhere in the country, you have to attend these refresher courses that the University Grants Commission runs through designated colleges. And the one that is run out of Delhi University was traditionally considered very prestigious. And lecturers would come from across the country because they would hope to get instructed by professors from Delhi University or JNU. What's happened now is that they've, they've drafted all these RSS fellows. So in one of the lectures, there was this, uh, and this is actually a true story. One of these uh, scientists said, you know, it's not true that uh, uh, gravity was uh, discovered by Newton and all this Apple stuff, et cetera. It was actually Aryabhat. And it was not an apple, but a lychee that fell on his back. <laughs> uh, so, you know, this kind of you know, utter contempt for, um, for, for facts, for knowledge, for history. You know, you have the, the junior education minister uh, trying to rubbish the theory of evolution. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I mean, I was appalled by his statement, but when I saw the video recording of this guy, you know, he's a former, he's supposed to be a scientist himself, right? he's a former police chief. And he makes this statement, I'll say it in Hindi first. He says, I haven't seen it today. No, he says, no one has not seen it today that in front of his eyes, a man becomes a man. That no man has so far seen, before his own eyes, a monkey becoming a human being. Right, so this is this so-called scientist's understanding of Darwin's theory. Forget about the rights and wrongs of Darwin's theory, right? So, you know, whether it's science, whether it's history, uh, I would say, you know, there's a, an all-round assault on, on, on reason. Uh, and that's the only way you push your agenda, right? So uh, it's, it's unfortunate uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, th this, is, this is the battleground they've chosen. And, you know, beyond a point, it's impossible to even argue with people. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, you have historians who are fighting the good fight. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that uh, this is probably an argument that you can't win on their own terrain. And that it's probably best to say, if somebody wants to argue that the Taj Mahal is only a temple, uh, you know, I would turn around and say, well, okay, what does that have to do with the 10 million jobs Narendra Modi promised he was going to bring, right? So let's, let's talk about that. Let's not talk about uh, other stuff. Uh, Anish, your question on um, the, the, the fear factor, whether the horse is bolted. I think, you know, it's, uh, it's hard not to feel worried. It's hard not to despair. It's hard not to get angry and upset, particularly when you uh, look at the state of the media, when you watch, you know, uh, my wife and I, whenever we tune into these channels, uh, and often we joke and we say, okay, I wonder what Muslim bashing the Times, Times Now is doing today. And we're kind of hoping that they're not doing it, but then we tune in and sure enough, there's some rubbish about what Muslims are up to, you know, uh, triple talaq or you know, some kind of topic that they would pick up and, and flog in order to show Muslims in a certain way. And that all these channels are doing that. So, so it, it is hard not to, uh, you know, despair at, at this sort of thing. But, I'd, you know, my sense is that, uh, I mean, I would still ho have faith in the uh, innate wisdom of people. 
in, in the fact that, uh, you know, when the Rajasthan government issues uh, a diktat as they did the day before, that uh, girls in state-run colleges cannot wear jeans, they have to come in salwar kameez, you know, girls are not going to accept that. Boys are not going to accept that. I mean, somebody is going to say, look, we don't want these guys interfering with every aspect of our lives. So, you know, I, I think at some stage, uh, the penny is going to drop that, uh, you know, um, whatever the faults of the Congress, whatever the faults of other parties, uh, whatever the perceived benefits of the BJP or Modi that we saw, uh, you know, the fact is that uh, he's not delivering on the benefits promised and we're getting all this other stuff that was kept hidden from us. Uh, so uh, it's pos and you know there are straws in the wind in terms of recent election results that suggest that um, you know the tide maybe has not turned or has changed but there is uh, I think the BJP has a harder battle on its hands uh, today than it would have envisaged even six months ago or a year ago and uh, so 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 I think things change I mean I uh, it's hard not to be pessimistic and I've painted a very dark picture I I, I submit I agree with you there. But uh, uh, you know, uh, we really have to have to you know soldier on. Uh, there is a lot of fear among, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, uh, at the risk of telling you yet another anecdote. But I recently had dinner with uh, with one of the few ministers who was still friendly with me, mm. uh, and uh, we, I, I uh, went to his house. And uh, when I entered, he said, uh, "Do you mind putting off your cell phone?" Uh, so I did. And as a, as a gesture of, uh, you, know, a, you know, as an act of a good faith, he, he turned his phone off as well. And then he took both the devices that were switched off to another room, turned on the stereo, and left these switched off telephones next to the stereo. And then we went to the next room to have our conversation, which was conducted in muted tones. Uh, and this is a minister. Uh, so there is a sense in which, uh, you know, bureaucrats, ministers, officials, journalists, uh, you know, it, it has become routine now, and, I, and this is part of my work practice. Any, any call to do with a sensitive story, uh, we now do on Telegram or on Signal or WhatsApp. We don't use a regular, uh, you know, if I'm discussing a sensitive matter, I do not use a uh, regular, regular mobile line. Uh, and uh, bureaucrats, politicians have all switched to this protocol. So there is a sense in which people feel they're being watched, they're being monitored. They may, they, there may be an element of paranoia here, but the fact that yeah. people, this is the perception, uh, you know, there is no smoke without fire, and people have a sense of, uh, of uh, the you know, degree to which governments or regimes are tolerant or intolerant, and this is one that does not brook dissent. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is, a lot, there is fear out there, but um, I would say that there's still a lot of... Uh, you know, when I, when I look at uh, young freelance reporters, you know, we get story pitches from across the country, uh, from even a place like Kashmir, which is a difficult place to report from. Uh, so, the, you know, there are a very, very large number of people who are very, very brave, who take risks, who uh, believe in, in writing, who believe in speaking, who believe in organizing meetings, who believe in organizing rallies, who are not afraid of going to jail. Uh, there's a young man, Chandrasekhar Azad, in Uttar Pradesh, who is the leader of the Bhim Army, which is a new Dalit movement, or you listen to Jignesh Mevani, a young lawyer and MLA, uh, or Kanahiya Kumar, or Shehla Rashid, or Richa Singh. You know, there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of guts out there, uh, which is very inspiring. And so, uh, you know, whenever one feels depressed or despondent, and you look at and see, well, people aren't taking this stuff lying down. And then you feel better and you feel inspired. <laughs> So before we draw the evening to a close, uh, can I just quickly uh, remind uh, some of you who have already registered, but uh, those of you who haven't, we've released the last few seats for our first ever South Asia Summit at LSE tomorrow. Um, because it's a Saturday, we're starting at the respectable hour of 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and it's only from 11 to 1 and then 2 to 4, and you'll be done by 4 o'clock. But they're two exceptionally well uh, populated panels by, very, um, by the experts in the field. The first one is on China's role in South Asia, and we are the South Asia Center. We are not an India Center masquerading as a South Asia Center. We do genuinely create conversations around South Asia. 
So the first one is a comparative analysis of what various South Asian experiences of China working in their countries are. Um, I don't know, Siddharth is talking about India, he'll have nothing to say because there is, of course, no, we've missed the bus in India on one belt, one road, but we'll hear about that tomorrow. And in the afternoon, we are presenting brand new research from, again, three or four um, speakers who are talking about the middle class in Pakistan, the middle class in Nepal, and the middle class in India, just to explore what this category of the South Asian middle class is. So it's going to be interesting, it's going to be um, short uh, and informative. So I hope any of you who haven't registered, please do just come along if you haven't. I think we may uh, be able to squeeze everyone in. But um, I would like to very warmly uh, thank our speaker, and I think the best way to thank Siddharth for uh, this wonderful talk is for us to read the wire, write for the wire, Professor Ghatak, uh, and, um, and contribute to the wire, I think. Uh, many of us have uh, read, there's a link at the end of every article. Uh, you've got to have a heart of stone not to once click that link and say, I would like to give. And you have uh, to be so an please, Indian citizen, right? But you have to, and so Siddharth's promised us that he's gonna find us ways in which we can. Can we? Hmm? If you're not Indian citizens, no, you can't. we can't. Uh, if you're Indian citizens living abroad, yeah, if you're an Indian passport holder, you can. Okay, great. So that's, that's a lot of people. And if you're not an Indian citizen, you can't give money. Moral support. Okay. So the rest of, uh, rest of non-Indian citizens can provide moral support. But we can all collectively together once more thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.